Hello, Internet, and welcome to another Wednesday's Serial. Sorry for being swarmy, a bit of audio testing there. Uh, complaints on the last video about my audio not being there, so damn well better work this time. Uh, fitzing and futzing, there's not much I can do, except for maybe project my innermost chi directly towards the microphone. Anyways, um... I'm here to talk some comics and I'm going to deviate and I'm going to wander because it has been too long and a large part of that is getting back from Japan. I've been getting back on track and I've prioritized reading over recording. Uh, I think that's usually for the best um, as we often, as we often, as I often say really, um, it's hard to find new things to say about serial installments of the same book, especially when you're talking about decompressed storylines that usually take about six issues to get around to having a freaking point. And so sometimes maybe a little bit of reprieve is the best thing to do, not so much because I'm out of creative juice, but because I'm out of creative juice uh, running over the same tread. So what better way than to start off by saying the exact same thing I've said 60 times before. Issue 60, TMNT, please do not read this issue if you have not read Turtles before. Um, this has become something rather unique, actually. Um, and I want to dive in on a way that most of you know about it, but I feel like this is the issue to maybe point it out again. Because 60 is a special number in comics, more so than 50, in some ways more so than 150. 60 issues is colloquially, at least within some of the circles I've run in, referred to as kind of the brass ring comics, or at least with Vertigo, the Vertigo brass rings. You have your Preacher, your Why the Last Man, your Sandman, your DMZs, your scalps, relatively huge installments in the comic universe, um, things that American comics are among the best. And these issues rotate and live somewhere in or around 60 issue runs. And when you think about it, how many comic runs make it past 60 issues? How many? It's actually compared to what comes out a really short list and especially considering that there's a great deal that come to 60 those that go beyond it tend to be the ones we expect your normal superhero fare of established characters and in a lot of ways this is that um i have trouble calling ninja turtles superheroes but it's also not that far removed from superheroics, even if I'm going to get technical. And what's really different here, though, is <laughs> the Ninja Turtles have had different runs. There was the initial run, of course, that took forever to get across, uh, you know, even to issue 10, um, because they were dealing with all kinds of craziness, and they had no idea that that train was going to keep running, as it were. And there's a lot of great stuff, but you get up to the last few Eastman and Laird issues, and then for the longest time, they let different creators just have a heyday with it. There wasn't any real continued storyline. It was just, have Adam do what you want with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the craziest thing we thought of in a moment that ended up being, you know, what funded them and made them for a lifetime. Then they came back with City at War, and that ended somewhere in or around this number, this magical 60 number that I'm pointing to, maybe assigning too much value to. But they went to Volume 2, that only lasted 13, 16 ish. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, and it's been years since I looked at it. Um, but went, it got to the teens, and then they moved to Image. Um, didn't do a run that lasted nearly as long, and I think is the most forgotten of the Ninja Turtles run. And uh, I mean, they had the Adventures run, um, 
you know, they had all, they had all these different runs, and the longest run of Ninja Turtles up to this point has been the second volume of Tales of TMNT. And there were certain stories in that that continued at certain points. There were certain, like, five-point stories. But for the most part, they were just Ninja Turtle stories. Um, and there wasn't as much of a continuity throughout. What's special about this run is, in a way, you see in very, very few comics, these are truly serial, serialized stories. These are additions to the greater whole. This is 60 issues of a continuing story that also plays into other miniseries and micro-series, however they've named it, that have gone through. Some of these depart far further and don't actually add to the main story, but are still enjoyable overall, like the uh, Batman Ninja Turtles, which was very well received. Um, and I know a lot of people now might be thinking, well, you know, Batman Ninja Turtles, why wouldn't it be well received? I'd like to point out most of the time that Batman does, especially cross-company crossovers, you get a Spawn and Batman or a forgettable Spider-Man Batman kind of deal going on. The fact that the Turtles Batman crossover was received so well is actually kind of a bit of magic working there, so that's pretty cool. And uh, the secret history of the Foot Clan, all that is essential, at, more so than even certain regular story installments. And the fact that they've created this interwoven story that's so tightly knit is pretty crazy and actually really unique, even among comics. Um, and I'm finding, as I move through and think about um, different runs that I've liked, when it comes to kind of the bigger properties, you know, Ninja Turtles, Spider-Man, whatever, those stories that are continued like that, like that's how Azrael's Wonder Woman run was for as long as it went. It was a very much, you know, each issue was an installment. Um, there was a period where they rotated through a bunch of creators on Spider-Man, but there's three issues a week, and it's written a lot more like a TV uh, show with uh, an A, B, C plot that kept rotating up. And uh, Dan Slott was one of the head ones on that, so was Joe Kelly. That's when we had, like, American Sun, and we were just coming off of One More Day and all that. That sort of aspect I really like when it's available, and it's something we don't get to see too often. Honestly, that's half the reason that I enjoyed the... Batman and Batman Robin Eternal runs from the New 52 so much because those miniseries felt like that and we were getting weekly installments. I don't know if I'd ever go back and read those now, the Batman ones. The others I, I have a lot more love for and I think I might. And the idea that you could essentially binge watch on a TV show in a way that doesn't resonate with other great comic runs, not that those aren't worth binging on in any ways, but um, there's just something special about the serialized nature and the fact that they've woven so much in this Turtles run. And there's so many characters. I mean, of course, the focus on the four, but each of the four kind of have their own um, characters that the rest of the cast is aware of, but they kind of have a special ownership of, and there's kind of different relationships. And it's just crazy how much they brought in to this, to this thing here. Um, if you're looking for something to really dig into, this is the book. There's no other book I think I could recommend more than this. So, Turtles again. I love Turtles. Oh my god, what a shock. What a... What an amazing revelation. Alright, next I wanted to talk about something I read recently, and it is not recent... Well, it's recent-ish. Um... <laughs> Something that I've been holding on to, and uh, especially in my time away, um, there was the Spider Woman crossover. And that was fun. That was good, decent comics, and it was a small little mini crossover, not even really event, I want to say, just a straight crossover. That was just old comic fun. Um, I, I don't think it's spoiling too much. Also, it's all out. Um, to say it, it focused more on Silk than the uh, Spider-Gwen character or the Spider-Woman, you know, Jessica character. And uh, them playing with these characters that are really in completely different points in their lives and are really, actually when you put them together you realize how different they all are. And I mean, I knew they were different characters, but kind of realizing, like, the representation of what these characters were putting out is actually pretty crazy, especially consider Silk's 
kind of Asian, but pretty white. She's, you know, that comic level. Um, Spider-Gwen, obvious, just white teenage girl. And then um, Jessica, Spider-Woman, being, a, a, you know, a mother, but still a white woman. I don't know, just, but these are so completely different characters, so great, and actually seeing them bump up and kind of seeing how the different writers and artists uh, took on these different characters was pretty, pretty cool. Um, it just kind of made me realize kind of that they had a special thing going, but also that this ride can't last forever, because, I mean, no matter how you cut it, there's three Spider-Woman books running right now, <laughs> and it, it's kind of like if they were running all the main Batgirl characters simultaneously and uh, <laughs> I think that would be cool and it'd be really cool to have that that crossover but uh, I, I don't know how long the market would uh, really you know push for that many of the same book at the same time <laughs> and I, I hate talking market for so but that's just like you know like how many of the pretty much the same idea can you have running and uh the fact that they're they've made this run for over a year for all of them is a pretty cool hat trick i think uh it's a fun book but it's one of those ones that you can't talk about without spoiling and there's nothing super revelatory in that event uh it's a fun you know they're crossing worlds because they're from different worlds even like the, the amount of just comic book craziness is just it's a fun summer romp action movie kind of deal uh, and I will say there is one scene where Spider Gwen shows up in this mech suit and she's just decked out like a 90s comic character with like a huge gun and bullets everywhere and all that. And it was just the coolest visual I've seen in a comic in years and made me realize, holy crap, this is just here for fun. And Oh, that was super. Um, and it was also kind of funny to realize that in their respective comics, they're basically all referred to as Spider Woman. And I don't know. It, it's just kind of cool, and you know, to have that kind of moment of, hey, it, it wasn't really like, you know, girl power, but I mean, it was just girls kicking ass, and it was just cool. It was just really cool to actually sit down. I'm actually kind of glad that I would just kind of be able to read that all at once. Um, but because I had put that off and I've only read it recently, um, I'm still catching up on my Spider Gwen and Spider Woman. Um, I'm almost there, but uh, it's not going to be until the end of the week that I do catch up. And uh, also, um, with my reading whatnot, I did put off reading trades. Um, I've been trying to read a trade a week and I kind of fell behind, but um, I, read, I, I caught up on that and I kind of counted that for one week. And then... Um, I read Batman Europa, and uh, I can't believe that took years to come out. Um, it falls apart at the end, hard. Uh, if people want to hear me talk about that, uh, please just let me know. But um, I don't have a lot positive to say, and I don't know. It, it was if if you read the back cover, you can pretty much deduce what happens throughout the entire comic because there's not a lot going on. Uh, <laughs> I should dig into comic section actually really talk about, huh? Mm. Mm. Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman's always a bit curious to talk about. Um, it's rare that we can have a discussion about Wonder Woman without just delving straight to her origin. And this new run is no different. Ha! <laughs> um, I am dead tired of Wonder Woman's origin, as I become dead tired of nearly any character's origin that I take a liking to. Actually, about the only character I think safe from that is Green Lantern, because when they feel the need to retell it, they can do it in about three panels. Uh, the f this Wonder Woman comic is something of an enigma to me. I think there's a strong story here, and I think the art on its face is good. It is good art. I just don't think it's good comic art. And there's a page I'm going to show you. I don't think I'm spoiling anything. If uh, <laughs> you just know that the cheat is in the comic. Bada bing, bada boom. You know the cheat is in the comic. That's not a spoiler. Can't be. But 
Look at this page of interaction. Look at that. That's three panels. And I know it's this is not a blown out thing. This is pretty typical for this comic so far. There are about a full sentence's worth of dialogue between them. And it's thin. It's a thin comic. It's such a fast read. And even, I, it's just too much. And when we flash back to Wonder Woman's origin, you feel that even more because you know where the story's going if you've read enough Wonder Woman. And knowing that it's going to take them six issues of that, which means by the time we get to issue 12, 13, means we might be somewhere between two different stories with this. At least the main stuff, I don't know where it's headed. But uh, what's also doubly painful is this tie between the origin and this comic going concurrently. It really does feel like they could have split the difference and maybe given half of it to a set of creators and given this to a set of creators and allowed two Wonder Woman books to run once a month. And since I don't give a crap about reading Wonder Woman's origin again, I could have just gotten one Wonder Woman book. And if they put in a little few more words, I'd be all on board. But the way it is, um, I just, I just, I don't know. It's not that I want to drop Wonder Woman. It's that I need a little more to read. I need a little more to chew on. And, uh, I'd rather take my time and read some older Wonder Woman, which I have been doing, uh, than, uh, you know, breeze through this. So this one, I think of the rebirth, I think m is among the first that might be on the chopping block. And I know I've been saying that I just, I haven't made up my mind on any of this yet. And I actually got a couple to try this week. So we'll see. One of the best bits to come out of Rebirth has been Action Comics by far. Um, they've been playing a lot with the Mythos and Lex Luthor and Doomsday and Superman. And in here, we get Wonder Woman. Quick to note, I think she says more in the first few pages than she said in the entirety of her own comic, uh, because they use full sentences and more word balloons. Uh, I just... I'm loving this comic. It's not super deep. It is standard Superman fare, uh, but it's quality <laughs> Superman fare. And uh, this is just moving at a pace that, you know, is getting me into it. That and I've been on a huge Superman kick lately. So uh, I, I don't know. If you're into Superman, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts, but I'm kind of uh, hesitant to put in too much rather than say, like, right now they're really mixing it up. And um, obviously, if you've heard anything about Superman Rebirth, you know he has a son, and that whole element and how they're bringing that in really does force a lot of things to be rejiggered. Right now, they're still kind of figuring out where Superman is in Rebirth. I'm, I'm sure they know they're putting it out. But um, as far as the story goes, that's kind of what it's about, because it's the old school Superman flying into this uh, New 50 universe where people have had this time kind of apart and all that. And it's an interesting little play that's coming out. It's a little slow. We're a few issues in, and I thought we would have been a little further along. But at the same time, the the drama that's coming out in the character interaction that we've had that is making it a bit slower is actually so strong that I don't care. This is the level of melodrama that I really do love about American comics. And then, oh my gosh, so this issue of Superman is crazy. So the Superman adjectiveless, Superman proper, uh, this book is, you know, the Batman and Robin of this rebirth. It's the same creative team, Superman with the Sun, kind of the same idea, but it plays so different. Um, in a, a perfect contrast, though, uh, Robin, Damien brought something out in Batman that in a way was positive and worthwhile. And what's interesting is what this looked like it was going to be an eradicator comic but what we're seeing is in a weird way superman 
being hyper protective of someone almost brings out a dark side in him and you know, not dark side of but i mean a element um of him and I, just seeing that is really interesting to kind of see how he's trying so hard to do the right thing but he's so worried and put in the situation of being superman with this and he might be going too far um worrying about his child that could do anything he could do but as a child and what powers pop and where and all that like it, it, but the kid isn't at puberty yet so you lose that metaphor just fine it's been done um it's fascinating and it's kind of fascinating because we're supposed to identify with superman so we are actually getting a coming of age story but we're getting it from the parents point of view which for superhero comics is not a thing we've really gotten. It's actually probably the most interesting ground we've gotten with Superman in a long time. I know there are certain comics that have touched on that ground before in the grand scheme of things, but on this level, um, in a standard superhero comic, I think this is actually kind of a big deal. So... I'm really liking the run. <laughs> so I know this one's a bit older, but I just decided to try it out this week since I finally had some space for it. Ah, uh, Batgirl and the Birds of Prey, as far as I'm concerned, bir Birds of Prey. And Birds of Prey has had many incarnations, but at the heart of the team for when it was best remembered, Oracle. Black Canary and Huntress. I small team, but kind of a perfect one. And this isn't like the days of yore. This isn't when Simone was getting her legs and this was her baby. Um, but it can't be anymore. But there's a kind of a legacy there. And Oracle's a character that meant something more to me. I've talked about it a number of times, but. Um, Birds of Prey also was something really special to me. For a few years, I couldn't afford as many comics. And me starting to do this channel was kind of me buying comics and realizing I wanted to talk about it because I was buying so many and it was an outlet. But before that, and through some of the early years of that, Birds of Prey was a uh, constant. It was my first real foray into DC regularly. And it is one of the longest runs I bought as it came out. Uh, and the first book I ever bought to follow a creator. And it's it's a book that means something to me. And I, I was willing to pick this up because the new 52 Birds of Prey just didn't do it. It wasn't anything I was looking for and it never felt right to me. Um, just wasn't my deal. This issue isn't recapturing that magic per se at a certain level it's kind of weird to juggle this like it's the same idea but they're playing around with it they're rehashing but it's completely different creators i mean at, at some point they kind of have to recapture some of it right but on the other hand it's years later the characters are in completely different places but the core of these characters is really there huntress is taking out mafiosos to uh deal with her family's sins. Um, Black Canary is dealing with her own personal things, but is kind of there. It's a little more than just the muscle, but the person on the street. And Babs is the brain of the operation, but in, at this point she's allowed to be out in the action too, which is something I've been against. A huge part of what I liked about it was a certain, I guess, Charlie's Angels aspect, right? Where you have this mastermind, this someone in the background who's just the information. And that's an aspect to a lot of things that I really like. I like that delineation because it allows uh, different types of characters to be in your story. But I think with such a small team and them needing to make it a little punchier, this might be a really interesting dynamic. The other aspect is currently I don't really have a team book I'm reading. I don't like big ensemble books, uh, Avengers, Justice League, all that. I mean, I like those books from time to time, that's what I'm saying. But I always like having a small team book. There's something about just small groups of people 
and their personalities interacting that grabs me in a certain way, kind of the way the serialization does. And for a long time, I was getting the fix by going back and reading through X Factor. That's a great example of the kind of dynamic that I'm talking about and looking for. Um, personalities bouncing off of each other, not everyone quite getting along, but it's, you know, they're together in a way and they're, they're dealing with it. They're, and as someone who values friendships a lot more, I think that's a lot of the reason why. But that element I haven't seen. And this book is like the biggest, like, friends book kind of looking thing that I think I've seen in a while. And so I think I'm going to give this book a shot. I just, I'm feeling it again. And there's enough nostalgia there, I guess. It's just, it's such a cool thing. And the elements are right there. And what's weird is they're playing the Huntress from the New 52 in a weird way that was basically just right out of Grayson. Um, they're coming off the fact that Black Canary had a rock band, but I and she kind of wants to get back to that, but I guess she's not sticking around, I don't know. And then you have this Batgirl, which I'm not huge on, but it looks like I don't have to read Batgirl to enjoy this. As long as that's the case, I think I can dig in. Um, I'm trying to remember, I'm hoping it's just once a month though, because I'd rather have one decent one a month than get this stuff pushed out. Detective Comics. DC Comics. Doing this book right. This issue really... I, I've been liking Detective Comics, especially between Batman and Detective Comics, which seem to have a very similar bent. This has um, Batman assigning Batwoman to train Clayface, Red Robin, and... Uh, <laughs> spoiler you know I there's this you know odd team but in Batman he's supposed to be training Gotham and Gotham girl who are Superman anagram characters I don't know it doesn't grab me as much this detective issue took it to the next level where we have the very concept of Batman in long form being played to political intrigue um, it's the best way you can round it without actually spelling it out I, this is so the Batman book I want. I've been kind of getting tired of Batman. The, the lukewarm Batman stuff just hasn't been grabbing me as much. Sorry, Luke. Um, uh, but I, this is everything I want in a Batman comic right now and I didn't even necessarily know it. This has just been stupendous um, and this is playing a lot to my personal taste which seems to be the theme this week. Um, political intrigue, um, kind of a small team deal and uh, being a bit more punchy. The only thing I haven't liked so far is one of the twists that they did kind of last issue with Kate's dad uh, turning out to be the big bad so far. Um, it felt a little little contrived, but uh, it, it got us where we're going, and uh, I, I think they're earning it more as they move along. Um, what, a, what a cool comic. What a, it's something that definitely does feel like they had to do in Rebirth that they couldn't have done in the new 52 with the way that was working out. Uh, yeah, Detective Comics. I'm reading Detective Comics. What a weird churn that is. Um, man, you know, so I, I will say this. As much as I'm kind of putting down on Wonder Woman and putting down on Batman in a way, um, those are decent books. There's, n well, there's not nothing wrong, but there's nothing truly inherently bad about those comics. The thing about this DC Rebirth is um, they're double shipping, which means there's a lot, and uh, they're putting out a lot of stuff, and it seems like there's a lot of good stuff coming out, which means the great stuff is what people are going to gravitate to, and the good books um, are going to be lost in the shuffle, and that's such a better place to be than where they were. Um, people are going to be leaving books behind because they can only afford so many, and they're going to get the ones that they're super jazzed about which is probably going to keep people probably buying one or two comics more than they would have uh, from DC. And right now, my pull is stupidly DC. A lot of this is because I moved a lot of stuff to trade, 
and a lot of that is because Marvel has priced themselves out and uh, frankly few of the books are quite on the par that DC is on average right now. Um, DC has the advantage of, you know, I'm trying things out, you know, it's a lot easier to be jazzed about where things start than usually where things end. But uh, that's where we're at right now, so live it up. Uh, <laughs> this has just been super cool. Um, so, yeah, I'm really curious what you guys are thinking about DC, and I need to look up some of that. I'm really curious what um, people are thinking about the Green Lantern books and about Aquaman and the Flash. Uh, so, yeah. I think that's it for this week. I really need to probably wind it down because this has been running forever. But I want to hit y'all soon with another comic review. And, uh, yeah, if you want to talk some comics, hit me up. Peace.